So when was the last time you were connected to the internet? Hours? Minutes? Seconds ago? How well do you understand the risks related to being online? And when was the last time you double-checked your security settings? So today we're going to take a look at the new security reality. And we're going to start by looking at your online lives. Then we're going to continue by looking at cybercrime. And we're going to figure out how we can protect one from the other. Keep in mind, this is not a discussion on privacy. So we're not going to look at how companies use the data that you give to them. Instead, we're going to look at how secure and how you can secure your data from cyber criminals and your ex-girlfriends, ex-boyfriends. <laughs> so let's get started. Once upon a time, it was very easy to protect every bit of information we collected because we knew where it was. So we had an address book, we had a mailbox, we had a calendar, we had a bank statement drawer. We also had a phone that was tied to a wire, to a wall, so we knew where that was as well. But as technology evolved, we started using the high-tech equivalent of that. So we started becoming more attached to it. Fast forward a few years, and you see that every device that we have got a lot shinier and a lot more powerful. Additionally, the internet got a lot faster, and the applications and websites that we were using became very smart, very addictive, and very easy to use. So it's only normal that we would start using those as the main way to communicate, to exchange information, to store information, to work, to play, and study. Something else changed at the same time. So have you ever seen this or this? It's a common sight at airports, cafes, uh, libraries. All these people are connected, uh, checking their email, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. They're exchanging homework via Dropbox, you name it. What is the one thing that all these people have in common? It's so obvious that it's sometimes easy to forget. Let me ask you in a different way. How does Instagram know that it's you sitting at a cafe trying to connect and upload photos? So the answer is simple. Every single person in these photos is connected to their online account using a username and password. Well, except this guy. He's offline. <laughs> so what's going on? Think of your online accounts as a safe. It's somewhere in the cloud. You can't see it. You don't really know where it is. And that safe opens with a key. That key is the only thing that the safe understands and respects. So it doesn't care who you are. The safe doesn't know who you are. Uh, when it gets the right key, it opens. So the person who has access to the key to your online safe is the person who can open that safe. Let's move to cybercrime for a second. So cybercrime is big business. There's a lot of threats, there's a lot of targets, and the motivations can vary. But all that can wreak havoc and cost a lot. So $3 trillion is the estimated annual cost in growth and productivity that is lost because of cybercrime. If you feel that you hear about cyber attacks every day, you're right. Cyber breaches happen every single day to many companies, and many companies don't realize that it's happened until a few months after the fact. Do you want to see some live attacks? So thousands of machines every second are trying to attack other machines. They're looking for vulnerabilities to take advantage of. There is an interesting fact about all this. We heard about the $3 trillion. We heard about the number of attacks that are happening and how frequently they happen. So there's a statistic that I find very exciting and interesting to consider. So 81% of attacks that happen are either because of stolen, weak, or lost passwords. So the attackers don't use expensive methods to breach accounts because they don't have to. Why would you drill a hole through a safe if you could just borrow the key? So this is the point where you start asking yourselves, well, I'm not a CEO, I don't have a company, I have nothing to hide, I have nothing to lose, why do I care about this? Well, this is the point where you should care because the attacks that are being used against corporate credentials are exactly the same attacks that are being used against your credentials. It's called phishing. Phishing is a technique used to steal usernames, passwords, and other sensitive information. 
There are other variants. So we have spear fishing, we have whaling, we have fishing, but we'll just use one term for today. So all the attackers need to do is make you do one of three things. Click on the wrong link, open the wrong attachment, or visit the wrong site. There's a lot of phishing attacks every day. 135 million emails are sent every single day that are phishing attacks. Additionally, we have many more that are being sent through social media and others through messaging applications. Let's look at some real examples. And when I say real, I mean really real. These are actual emails that I received in the past few weeks, and I thought I would use them as examples. I'm probably going to make a few friends angry because I'm checking my spam folder before I respond to them, but I hope they'll forgive me one day. So looking at this message, it's trying to take advantage of your sense of urgency, of, of your fear that you may get locked out of your account. It has a very bad writing in its, in its message. So if you read it carefully, you're not going to see uh, what you would normally see from Outlook.com. And if you hover your mouse over the link that it's asking you to click, you'll see a site that's definitely not Outlook.com. So you shouldn't click on that link. You know, one in 20 of these phishing emails get opened. And you may wonder why. You may think it's, it's obviously a, a false message. Why should I open it? Why would somebody open it? Well, it happens because we're in a hurry and we're not paying attention. So interesting statistics again. 25% of phishing emails are opened in the first 10 minutes that they're sent. 49% of those emails are opened in the first hour. And almost half, 42%, of all phishing emails that are sent are open from a mobile device. So again, we're in a hurry and we're not paying attention. Let's look at this. So if you pay attention to that address, there's a typo in there. Uh, you see there's an attachment. Hopefully you haven't clicked on it so far. And the message you'll see, it's trying to direct you so that you can open that attachment. So hovering over those links doesn't do anything. Those actually are broken links. And it's trying to frustrate you to move to the attachment. It actually gives you the instructions to do so again. So hopefully, at this point, you would know not to click on the attachment. This email is getting trickier, because this one is from an actual friend and directed to me. So it has her name a few times, also has my name, trying to make me comfortable with this message enough so that I would click on the wrong link. Uh, this is the bad website that you should not go to. And trying to make me feel more comfortable when I'm receiving this, it says that it's been checked for viruses. I can tell you it was not. So I'd call that fake news. So what happened with my friend, a few days later, she sent out a message. She realized what happened, and she sent a message to all her friends saying that you shouldn't open that message. Has anybody ever had to send that message out? Don't be shy. I see you. You must be over there. So uh, you don't want to be in that situation where you have to send an apology and asking people not to click. The last one we're going to see is an SMS message. So same technique used via email. It's asking you to urgently deal with your account. It doesn't explain which account, so you may get confused and click. That's the bad website, and that's where it takes you. So at this point, you're asking, what can go wrong? I clicked on the wrong link, so what? Well, a lot is happening underneath the surface that you won't see. The average user will not notice what happened. They may see that their browser crashed, the email application crashed. They won't think more about it. They'll just reboot the computer and move on with their lives. But when you open that attachment or when you click on that link, there's a chance that some malicious software could get installed. It's called malware. So when that malware gets installed on your computer or your phone, the attacker has succeeded. The reason they've succeeded is because they wanted that software on your machine. They could do a few things with it. One of them would be install a keystroke logger. So everything you type from then on will be recorded. Usernames, passwords, credit card numbers. Another thing that could happen, ransomware. So ransomware is, uh, is a piece of software that encrypts your sensitive files against you. So the files are encrypted until you pay ransom to get access to them again. You don't want to do that. Next thing is Bitcoin mining software. So they may install Bitcoin mining software, the one that uh, you've heard in the news, but they're using it on your machine, and somebody else is making money off of it. 
And finally, you may become a zombie machine. A zombie machine, you saw all the attacks earlier. You saw all those thousands of machines trying to look for other vulnerabilities in, in other machines. So zombie machines essentially are launching pads for attackers. Instead of their, them using their own machines, they're using you for the attack. And there is another thing that's bad about the situation. So you're becoming part of the problem. So when your device is infected, it starts sending messages to your friends and your contacts and potentially infecting them. So the picture looks pretty red and pretty bleak, but we can talk about what to do. So there is hope. That's the first thing you should know. And we'll start with common sense. So situational awareness, and when you're looking at your surroundings and making sure you understand what's going on, we should apply the same thinking, situational awareness, online. You don't want to be in red mode. You don't want to be panicked. Everybody's after me. Everybody's trying to get me. And you don't want to be in green mode, la la land. I don't care, I don't know, I don't understand. You want to be in yellow mode. You're relaxed, but on the other hand, you're also cautious and suspicious. For example, you don't want to click on link if you don't know where it's going. If your bank is asking you to urgently log in, don't open that email, just go directly to your bank account. And if, if you go there, then there's a message for you waiting if it's legitimate. The other thing is you shouldn't open attachments unless you know whom they're from and why they sent it to you. The next best thing you can do after common sense is enable two-factor authentication. So two-factor authentication requires a username and password as usual, but also something that only the user would have on them. For example, a phone. So when somebody tries to log in from anywhere in the world, a request will come to your phone saying, do you, is this you trying to connect from a new device? And do you approve this request? So if you say yes, then there can be a login. If you say no, you can, it will be declined, and you'll also notify that somebody's trying to get in. 90% of Gmail users have not yet enabled two-factor authentication. If you're one of those 90%, try to move away from that. It's free, it's cheap, and it's going to make a big difference. So the other thing you could do, the, there are sites that don't allow two-factor authentication yet. So there is a situation where you just have to have a username and password. In this case, you want to make sure you're not reusing your bank account or your email passwords with other simpler sites such as a newsletter website. Another thing you want to consider is a password manager. And finally, don't use your pet's name. Everybody who has Instagram knows your pet's name. Everybody who's on Facebook probably knows your Facebook, uh, your birthday, uh, because it's written. Next, update your devices. If there is a fix for the malware, the malicious software that's trying to install itself on your computer, you want to have that update. So update your phone, update your tablet, your computer, update your antivirus, and you'll be more secure. The question about Wi-Fi was probably on your minds, and uh, you've probably asked yourself several times when you're joining a Wi-Fi network at a cafe. So don't join a, a, a Wi-Fi network just because it's free. If you don't need to do much on your computer, just, just you know, use your data plan from your phone, tether from your phone. Um, other things you can consider a virtual private network. So VPN service is an extra layer of protection when you're connecting to not necessarily secure networks. The final thing you should do, and this could also be seen as common sense, but we need to remind you to make sure that it's something you keep in mind as a special item, would be plan B. Backup. So make sure that you identify what your sensitive information is and you make an offline copy of it. So if everything else goes wrong, if you lose your phone, if you lose your computer, if somebody breaks into your online account and, and wreaks havoc in there, at least you have a backup. So this is a lot of information and, and we can't say that there is anything as absolute security. So all these create a very high barrier to the most basic attacks and you should be in a much better shape than you were before doing these. By protecting your online accounts, you also take responsibility for protecting your friends and your connections, which is a great thing for them and for you. Now, if you found all of this overwhelming, remember that passwords are like underwear. Change them often, don't share them with anybody, and keep them private. Thank you. <laughs>